Wow, I don't, I don't, if you ever uh, visited the campus, I don't know that you would refer to our live operation to sophisticated. Uh, big yes. Uh, I've been in LA for a few years. Uh, I lived in Seattle for a while and coming back and seeing the traffic here. Uh, I think LA gets the bad rap here. The traffic here is amazing. Um, one of the things that's interesting about that is that uh, at some point today we'll probably have the entire, what, what is the, uh, the equivalent of the entire population of Seattle uh, online playing League of Legends. Um, we, we've, we've seen um, about the population of Canada uh, tuning in at one time to watch our world uh, championships. And you see the, um, you see the uh, population of Canada plus the UK is about what our daily actives can be. Uh, so, so, it, so it is a big game. Um, but I think one of the, one of the things that's, uh, I'm going to actually uh, counter what James said earlier. I, I don't think that live services is important. or uh, That's what we refer to as live services. I think it's the most unimportant thing that we do in the industry, right? We're about product. We make phenomenal, engaging product for the teams. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we work from our live service a little bit differently, maybe, than what's been described earlier. Um, I, I, I like to tell my team that what we do is the most insignificant component uh, of anything that we do at the company. Uh, we don't make the cool content. Uh, we're not making the cool videos or any of the, uh, the amazing artwork or the, the phenomenal engineering that goes into delivering the experience to the player. Um, but without our team, Everything else doesn't matter at all. Uh, if you watch Netflix, you don't go there because you can log in and because of the, the stability of the content stream. Uh, you go there because the, uh, the movies are great, right, or the, the TV series. Uh, but you can sure drive people away with your live services. Um, so what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the way that we look uh, at what's important to, to us as a company. Uh, and I think this is really important. When you talk about the flow uh, of what goes into any team, initiative, effort, business, even what you're doing in your personal life, you tend to have a goal. And if you don't identify your goal and what's important to you, you have a hard time actually delivering uh, predictable results. So what I, what I love about the company that I work with now is that uh, I didn't get into, into video games because I was a business person. Um, and I, I would assume a lot of us in this room got into, this, got into the industry because we're gamers, right? Uh, and we probably all have that moment, that, that one time that we can rem remember back, that exciting moment. Uh, my, my favorite memory, have you, who's played League of Legends in the room? Anybody? A couple of you? Yeah. Um, anybody got a pinnacle? No? Awesome. Uh, I, I've got a couple, uh, and that's a pretty big event. Uh, but my first quadra kill, we only got four kills in a game uh, at one time, was actually one of my most memorable uh, uh, moments because um, I was playing at home and I yelled so loud that the dog jumped up and started barking and, uh, and, and broke a lamp. But anyway, it was still worth it. Uh, it was an amazing experience. But I think about that when I think about what I'm doing from a live ops perspective. I think about uh, that type of experience. So. When I joined, um, this was our, our, our monitoring service. And so what we do from a live service perspective is a little bit different than what we talked about earlier with monetization and the events. Uh, we really have a content team that generates the, uh, everything, that all the new champions, all the new content that, that we update the players with. Um, but they also manage the events. Uh, we have another team from a publishing perspective that looks at things like uh, player acquisition. An interesting thing about League is uh, it's such an in-depth, difficult game that our, our, our standard content acquisition is, is not what, what you may, may find in the industry otherwise. Uh, our most sustainable players are invited from their friends because it is kind of tough and you have to really be engaged. Um, but our e-commerce is a part of that. Um, and then we have, I guess, our live operations. So fundamentally what we do is we make sure all the content and everything that's created by other parts of the company kind of work as expected. Um, we talk about what we do, uh, it's a very clear focus, which is protect the total player experience. Uh, we want to make sure that everything that's created works as intended. Uh, when we look at our NOC, or Network Operations Center, uh, their goal is to be first to know. And I think this is important, we talked about the goal component earlier. Uh, every component of your company needs to understand how they build into this bigger overarching, uh, ar arching effort. Uh, so if we're first to know from a NOC perspective, uh, we can help protect the total player experience, which helps us be the most player focused company in the world. Um, once, once you define your purpose, I think, and you, you've probably seen this, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, I really believe that the culture is what unlocks your, your potential to hit your goal. Uh, if you look at the Peace Corps and the Marine Corps, radically different purposes and goals. The culture that supports the achievement of each one, pretty differently. And then I think you get into staffing, and that's who you hire, who you fire, and what you do with them while you have them. And there's uh, a lot of uh, conversation that could go into that alone. But I don't think you can make great food with bad ingredients, and I don't think you can have a, su a successful operation with people that aren't the best that you can find. Um, and I think it is important once you do that to define the rituals. Uh, and a lot of this is the way that we review this, the, the numbers that we'll look at here in just a bit. Um, 
So when we were in, and we still do this, when we get into, into problem states, we'll do an incident review every single day, and we'll look at this, uh, and that, that ritual brings a focus and importance on what we do. I think once you have the rituals, the, you then move to the audits, your KPIs. How do you know that you're actually on track? And if you do that well, hopefully you'll have results that book in the other side uh, that matches your goal, right? So when I joined, uh, again, uh, we're on our way to being uh, one of the most played games ever, uh, and this was our, our knock team overnight, right? Uh, we had a guy that would log in, you see him playing. Uh, he's got the forms up and he's got email. Our, our monitoring service uh, and alerting was really exchange. And so what would happen is if he saw something, he would make the call on the bat phone to the one live producer that, was, uh, that would manage anything that happens, and that would be about a, maybe a 48, 72-hour stint, and you would just try and survive uh, those phone calls. And I think I've wept twice as a grown man. Uh, once was when my puppy died uh, 12 years old last Christmas. Uh, the other one was when I got a call after the longest period of sleep I'd had in the last six weeks, which is about three hours and 15 minutes, just got off a triage call and got another call. Uh, Europe was down. Uh, that one tear is uh, etched in my memory. Um, but one of the things that really helped us uh, was that we did, we did care. We were small, we were scrappy, and we're going we're gonna to talk about what we aspired to build. Um, so let's move on. Uh, one of the things that we, that we manage in live services, uh, and we'll, we'll, dovetail, we'll tie that back in, that, that knock that we started with, uh, was we moved the release team into the operation space uh, because it impacted the, um, the player downtime. And you look over, uh, one of the things that was important was the, um, we looked at this every single deployment. And we were averaging eight or nine, 10 hour deploys back in 2011 when I joined. Um, in the time that we've dropped this, we put, a, we put a goal where we can drop the time on this. And we looked at this every, every single release. Um, when I first joined the team, I, I, and this is a true story, uh, but I joke about it frequently, I put a stopwatch to the team as they, went, as they were doing the deploy. And we shaved an hour off simply by, by maximizing, uh, or minimizing rather, the delays between one team being ready handed off to another team. Um, when I look at the time that we've saved uh, by putting a focus on looking the, at the actual deployment times and measuring it, which we didn't effectively do uh, prior, uh, we've saved tens of thousands of hours. I think we've actually saved something in the area of 22,000 player years of play time, of uptime, uh, by increasing uh, our availability by decreasing the amount of time that we're down. Uh, when you look at uh, tens or even hundreds of thousands of players that are affected when the game service goes down, uh, putting a focus on this is important. And like I said, we don't really focus on the monetization component. We feel that if we build a good business model, uh, the best way to increase monetization is by uh, increasing the available number of players. Um, and one unique thing about uh, Riot when I joined was the way that the free-to-play model actually works is that any, any power, any, ab uh, any ability to, to do better than another player is something that can't be purchased. It's only that can be earned in-game. The cosmetics is what we, uh, what we monetize and we make our money off of. So, um, so one of the things moving over to how we looked at the knock monitoring, uh, initially um, we talked about how everything that was found, if there was a problem in the game, it was tracked through email. So you can imagine showing up and saying, okay, let's look at the number of incidents we had over the last month. And it's just, you have to sort through email. Uh, the average duration, when you look at uh, being able to look at the, the, the what is the number one problem that you can knock out of your, your service impacting uh, problem space, and you can't really find that. Uh, and I actually like, uh, it was Andrew, the, uh, the, uh, the, the sticky notes. I liked how, visibility, uh, how much visibility that, that brings. Um, we actually did move into JIRA uh, for a very important reason, which was for the tracking component. Uh, we used JIRA for, uh, for our, our dev management and our QA process, so the bugs are entered in there. So it made it very easy to tie an outage to a particular change. And to, I think to be effective in live operations uh, from, a, from a stability pro uh, standpoint, you have to have the good fundamentals of ITIL, right? And that's the, the circle of uh, introducing new change, which we always have to do. Uh, and then tracking the incidents and then good, doing good problem management. Uh, and if the problem management typically generates more change. Um, and so hopefully you get that, that, that sphere tighter and tighter where you inject more, I'm sorry, the more changes you inject, uh, you create less incidents. Um, but one of the things that I found uh, was the team that was their, that was their primary mission, right? We, we talk about these very clearly defined goals. Your reason for existing in the knock space is to be first to know. If you know the problem before a player uh, sees it, um, we can respond to it fast. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we try, tie that in. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is when we put it in JIRA, uh, it still didn't seem like we were getting any better. We, we could now track it, we could kind of see what the problems were. But I didn't feel like NOC was doing their primary mission of being first to know. So I made a simple request that we add a field to JIRA, did NOC find this first, yes or no? And it was a very clear pass or fail. 
And every single day at 5 p.m. we would do our incident review. And if that was a fail, we would ask ourselves, if this happens tonight, what would we do, what would we do differently so that this doesn't happen again? Um, the first time that we ran this query, uh, we had this data, we saw, uh, I think it was about a 9% success rate. Yeah, so that's a 91% failure rate if you want to look at it from a, from a different lens. Uh, and a lot of people say, wow, that's horrible. And I get really excited about this because, no, it's amazing because now we know, right? And if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So the next month, you can see it climbed up to, I think, I think we hit 34%. We got right up, uh, up to 54%. Uh, and then we kind of plateaued. I told the team, made them a promise. I said 80% seems reasonable. Uh, that's, that's not quite as good as what we did the last company I was with, but I think we can get there. If we can do that, I'll take you guys to Disney. Uh, so the next month, 78%. So 78% is not 80%, so that wasn't a Disney trip. Um, but you can see we did cross that, th that threshold and we hit that. Um, and so uh, they actually uh, they asked for a steak dinner and I, I gladly paid for that. Uh, now we're hovering 96, 97% of all things first to know. Um, but why is this important? Uh, otherwise, this is an arbitrary goal that leadership is setting. And if you don't buy into the, uh, the reason, the, the belief in why this helps our, our, our overall goal, which is to, to, um, to support the player experience, what we did was we, we showed the data that showed with monitoring versus without monitoring. And you can see that the, uh, the line that tracks when we find the, the incident first, obviously our time to resolve is much faster. Uh, and I think these are all actually accurate numbers, um, but I, I'll tell you this, I'll never let facts interfere with a good story. Uh, but what you want to do is inspire people why this is important. Um, one of the things that we do is, um, is we have to influence the development team because at the end of the day, a live operation team cannot engineer good quality into product. It's, it's practically impossible. So the dev ownership was, was, was super vital. And you know the difference between influence and manipulation? It's intent, right? Uh, and so when you talk about the difference between throwing somebody under the bus and bringing visibility to a problem, what's the difference, right? It's intent. So one of the things that I enjoy about the, the teams that I work with uh, and the company as a whole, but, um, but the live team is, is fanatical of, about radical transparency. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we have, we're not actually in the seven kingdoms yet, but that's, uh, that's on our roadmap, I think, for the company. But we, uh, we do like to show very visibly on a monitor, we have these, uh, these information radiators throughout the company, and this is worldwide. So you can see maybe if this is Europe and maybe this representation is North America. Uh, and then finally you have a representation maybe of, uh, of well, let's say, Korea. Um, and these are all just uh, uh, num numbers and, and, uh, and data, for example. Um, but what we do is, is we push out accountability. Uh, in the military, they call it a distributed command. And it's one of the most effective ways to scale, but it requires, it goes back to that component we talked about, purpose, um, culture, and staffing. Your staffing has to be world class if you're gonna be able to push out that level of authority. And so we do this at the, um, at the regional levels. Uh, so that the accountability structure happens at the country managers. And so to do that effectively, we bring this visibility. So if you're running Europe, you'll actually see on the same monitor that, that looks the same as it does in North America and Korea and every other place that we operate, you'll see your scorecard stacked up against everybody else's scorecard. And why is that? Because we want to make sure that there's visibility into performance. Uh, and it is a competition. Uh, you don't want to be last place. Uh, but what's great about this is it really shows you the people that are performing. And if you're in, if you're in, uh, in say, Europe and you see uh, Korea performing well, then that's, that's a person that you, can, uh, that you can go to and ask them why that's, why that's working. Uh, we can also bring in help to support you know, underperformers. So that visibility is key. And that's one of the things that we, that we really focus on is, is looking at those things that are important. And all this, again, tracks back to how it actually impacts the player. Uh, I'm going to go back to this just real quick. Um, this was actually set up to not, this is one of the things that we get distracted by. We get distracted by our own technology, our own success in live operations, our own ability to perform our job well. And it's not about that. It's about what you're doing to, to the end user. It's about the player experience. And if what you're doing is phenomenal, but it doesn't drive a better experience, then you need to really reevaluate re -evaluate what it is that you're looking at. Um, but these, these components that we actually bring very, very visible uh, is all around, uh, look at these, like these are store load, or the store load times. So this is something that a player actually uh, experiences. It's not about the data that we find valuable, but it's about that, what every player worldwide kind of feels. So one of the things that uh, is, as you move over into improving the quality of your service and your stability in your uptime, um, it's really hard to do that downstream. Uh, 
you know, I, I, I remember talking to the president of the company, Mark Merrill, I said, is it really fair that the owner of life services is responsible if an engineer puts a one instead of a zero, if QA doesn't catch a, an escape defect, if uh, a data center tech restarts Europe accidentally instead of North America? Of course it's not fair, but it's the truth and it's the reality and it's that level of ownership that makes you powerful. If you're gonna be effective at this, what you've gotta do is a fi find a way to influence the people that are creating the problems and putting that ownership, if you, if you make it, you own it end to end. And so, one of the things that we do is visibility around on-call success. One of my biggest mistakes, you talk about these failure stories, was I held a hot fix on a Sunday night um, that was a major disruption to the game. And this was right about the time that we were launching into the esports component, right? And what were, we what were we trying to do with esports? Not make a great video game esports. We were trying to, we were trying to change the way that esports operated within the space. Uh, I remember somebody in a, in a magazine said they're not, they're not trying to make a great esports. They're trying to make baseball. And that's really what we're looking at. And so in the moment that we're trying to do this, I hold a hot fix um, that, that came, that was ready for deploy late Sunday evening until Monday. And what happened, it went viral, all the YouTube videos of all the cheats. And one of the most painful things in my, in my career is seeing on Reddit somebody saying, this is why this game will never, or any game will ever be a viable sport. It's too easy to be hacked. And um, yeah, and that, that's something I'll carry with me forever. Uh, I had a conversation with the, the, the president of the company uh, after he let me get through triage, but if, as you can imagine, he probably wanted a, a walkthrough on kind of the decision-making framework that went into that. And uh, I shared that, there, that our on-call was not where it needed to be. Uh, I frequently made calls and I'd have to escalate and, and I couldn't get the response. And my intention, uh, while misplaced, was actually to protect the player experience. And uh, that, was, that was not lost on me. It took me a little while to understand, but the, all the questions about why I was doing this and why did I do this and my thought process, he didn't care that I made a mistake. Uh, that what the company really cares about is that your intention matches your goal, which is to be the most player-focused company in the world. And, uh, and that's, that's, I mean, that's the reason I'm still with the, the company five years later. Um, so when you have a problem with, with, not, with unresponsive escalations, and I hope you don't have this problem, uh, and it's not that we, didn't, we had a company that didn't care, we had a, uh, a group that cared tremendously, but they didn't necessarily have the visibility on, on what we were doing. And so we used a, a third party uh, company called PagerDuty, and any time an escalation happened, uh, again, you talk about these information radiators, uh, we'll take over these radiators whenever we need to bring visibility within the organization. And I think that's one of the things that we do well is we bring focus onto the things that we want to achieve. Riot's kind of unique, and if we want to move mountains, if we wanted to go to the moon, I think we could absolutely do that. We will struggle to put our shoes on the right feet if we don't think it's important. Um, but we have to get alignment about the things that are important. And, um, and one of the ways we do this is, again, through this visibility. So we have these monitors, and we can, these monitors are on wheels. We can roll them up to whoever needs to see them. Um, they can be in front of the restrooms. Uh, we'll put them in front of our cafeteria so that you'll see it. And so the interesting thing, if you look on both sides of this, there's kind of the branches on the fail tree and the pass tree. And when we launched this originally, we had significant branches on both sides. And what was not surprising was when we brought visibility to this, those branches on the failure side were rapidly chopped off, right? You didn't want to be the person that didn't, that, you know, that's on the, on the fail list. So the, the response of the on-call was radically increased. But the, the thing that surprised me a little bit, and in hindsight, maybe it shouldn't have, but the branches on the past side, this the incidents that were created that were being responded to, those were rapidly chopped off as well. And I think that comes into the, the core component of a, a method of bringing visibility to the, to the dev ownership, right? And so again, what's the difference between throwing somebody under the bus and bringing visibility? Uh, sometimes it's results. And I think this is the way that we brought uh, a very clear um, me message to the entire organization uh, that responsiveness to the player is something that's really important and we brought visibility to it. And so, I wanna go back to this component, right? We were starting with this, but this is a, the single, the single person watching overnight um, and we've grown to not just this and if you can look across the top of the screen, that's, that's every player is represented worldwide in the, the graphs and we've got, um, a cool, they call it the, uh, the bridge of the enterprise, and when we do our tours, that's a, that's a stopping point. It looks pretty neat for a lot of tech nerds. Um, and of course, we have another one of these in Dublin, uh, and what I'm really proud of is we've recently launched one in Asia, so we have a follow the sun model. And if you work in live ops, uh, and you've ever been in triage, right, you know that you don't get Thanksgiving. Uh, that's not a day off. That's a day off for some people, but not, not in the live space. Uh, what was really cool is we launched in Dublin. You know what they call Thanksgiving in Dublin, right? Thursday. So those guys were glad to work it uh, and the rest of us. And so this is the first time in 15 years that the team had Thanksgiving off in the U.S. And of course, we worked St. Patrick's Day for them and now in Asia. And the other thing is we're not working graveyard shifts when we've got an active-active. Um, and so the progress 
uh, was incremental. And it's, that's the thing that's, that's important to understand is you don't necessarily, it would have been unwise to build a multi-million dollar operation center for a company that was just starting off. Um, but the, just likewise, you know, how you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Uh, if you got 1% better a day for a year, how much better are you? And if you say 365%, you're wrong. Uh, it's, it's incremental, right? You, if you can't walk, you crawl. And eventually you can run. And eventually you can fly. And so what I love about this, this path is we were, we were talking about um, growing into this huge organization where millions of players are going to be playing today. Uh, tens of millions will play this month. Uh, tens of millions of people will watch our world championship this year. But it's not about that. What's important to remember is that you're running a live service from an operation of stability. It's about the individual. All these people matter. And so I think one of the, the things that, um, that is really important from a live operation space, and you talked about that earlier, is not let a team get segregated off into a corner. You're part of what your company does, and what your, what your company does is engage with players and brings phenomenal experiences. And I think that's one of the most important things that you can do is create great experiences that they can share. And we can talk a little bit about some of the, the steps that we've made even beyond that. But I think that's what's the, the thing that you have to remember in live operation space is, is to not focus so much on the big that you ever forget the front line. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a value that, that's easy to slip away. So at the end, our mission isn't successful uptime or solid KPIs or any of the other metrics that we look at from a cool, nerdy tech factor, but it's about serving the needs of the player and you can never forget what that need is and what that experience is like. So thank you. All right, thank you. Questions? Uh, hi, um, Andrew from Space Ape Games. I'm really curious, how much did you automate? Because you talked about your knock guys kind of just watching the forums and playing the game, but what did you do for like alerts and automation? Yeah, and I, I think um, there, there's a few ways to do that, and I do think the future, uh, the space uh, of, of monitoring is gonna be significantly different in five, six years, seven years, maybe even faster than that, I think with AI solutions. Uh, so we we use a variety of, of, of off-the-shelf components from things like Nagios, uh, I think we're using Big Panda now as well. Um, there's uh, the developers actually actually are, are, are doing a great job at, at self-recovery. Self um, and we, we actually, I was just telling the story earlier, um, that my favorite employee is actually an automated bot that we rolled out for the Security Operations Center, SockBot. Uh, works weekends, works evenings, uh, not an HR complaint yet, we'll see. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I think the way of the future is, is, is exactly that. I, don't, I, I think you have to be careful that. I actually worked with a, a previous company where we had self-heal uh, and automation to the point that the game was actually falling over and the, the, the end user experience was actually bad, but it was recovering so fast that, that it didn't require the human intervention. And I, I think fa uh, failure should be a little painful. And so I think you've got to make sure that you never automate your way out of feeling what the players experience. But, the, the, but, but it's a heavy emphasis on that, um, even to the point that uh, the way that we operate is not strictly around uh, like budget so much as it is finance projections. And so when I present kind of what I plan to spend, there's, there's always a great emphasis on, on uh, buying engineers versus uh, like first responders. You really want to move from a fire department to a fire marshal where you can actually fireproof versus being really great at firefighting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my, my, this is Scott with Reliance. Uh, kind of a follow-up to that. How did you guys, uh, when you move between time zones, um, what's the, what do you guys use for communication? So, uh, for example, if somebody jumps on a ticket, um, but then it's right at that crossover point, you know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, how do you make sure that that information gets communicated to the next team? Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, so a couple is we have a, a live uh, telepresence uh, across the, all the regions as well. Uh, another thing when we get into like uh, a bad state, and I don't know if you could see it, we'll go back and see if we can see the, the picture. Uh, in the background, there's actually a separate room that's, uh, that the windows are intended to slide open, uh, and so that's our triage war room. So if we ever have a, um, like a massive deploy or anything that goes wrong that's or an extended uh, DDoS attack or something like that, we'll bring in the, the engineers and they'll actually work side by side with the, uh, the monitoring team. Uh, the other thing is that when we have, uh, we categorize the incidents between uh, player impacting, non-player impacting, and severity. Anything that's a, a major severity player impacting, uh, that'll have a specific handoff where the, uh, there'll be an overlap. Uh, we have a pretty flexible schedule as well, so that we, we have an open PTO policy with the, the, the company as well as, as fairly flexible hours. The knock is, you know, you stay, you got to stay a little bit closer to your schedule from that perspective. Um, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not infrequent that if there's a, a problem that will require that, that knock technician will, will, stand, uh, will stay online until, until it's uh, sorted. And if he needs to come in a little bit later the next day, we're completely flexible with that. But the, the big thing is the, 
it goes back to, I guess, the culture, and the culture of ownership is, is extreme. Uh, and it's not, the, what I love about the, the NOC team, it's, it's not, you know, they own that problem right there side by side. We, we, uh, we actually refer to ourselves as uh, short-term saviors but long-term partners. We don't, we don't ever want to get into the state where we continue to, uh, to solve for the, player, uh, the pain points that are generated by somebody else. We want them to do a better job of owning that. But uh, in the meantime, we'll definitely stand, stand the line to protect the player experience. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, Brandon Zahan, 343 three Industries. So can you talk a little bit about uh, managing expectations with uh, partners who you have external dependencies on? Um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, um, in, in Xbox is uh, it's not just your own servers, but you're working with Xbox Live. You've got CDNs that are having problems and trying to root cause and get somebody on the phone from those external teams can often be really challenging. Yeah, um, I, I, but it, I remember having this conversation with one of the uh, the live ops guys when I when I took the team after I joined, um, and, and and he'd used the phrase something about it not being our fault uh, in in reference to a, a data center, and we actually just had a data center issue uh, in the Philippines last week that it resulted in I think a twenty hour downtime, which is uh, which is extreme, uh, and it was primarily uh, the data center power had dropped. But the, the reality is um, that those players are our players, and the way that we look at it, at least, is that every, every component of that is we're accountable for, maybe not responsible for everything, but somebody in our organization made the decision which data center to, to, to use. Uh, they reviewed the data center, and I mean, I've been on site to the ones in Frankfurt and, um, and Amsterdam, and you know, the things that I, that I want to see is, is, is prior outages, I want to see their, their reliability, I want to see how many power lines they have, what kind of generator, whether it's chemical or uh, uh, I think we have an enormous flywheel in one of them that, that powers. Um, everything that we choose to operate with, um, we need to validate that it works and if not, uh, be ready to, to either manage your player's expectations or make a solution that works for that. If you haven't looked at it, I won't go into, I won't go into details now, but, but, uh, but Google Riot Direct, where we tried to, to solve a lot of those things that would be historically somebody else's problem. Um, and the thing with, that we did with the, uh, the, the World Championships in season two, I don't know if anybody was watching then, but we had, um, I think something like four million players online. Uh, and we were in the Staples Center in LA, so we had probably 20, 30,000 people in the stadium. Uh, and we were still running off the uh, off the internet, and we had a we had a major failure there, um, and so we actually had to delay and postpone. It was a very it was a it was a, one of our big failures in our history, uh, and so we had to we had to move some of the uh, the player matches uh, from being spectated uh, to other events within our own our, our own space, and the team uh, went home that Sunday night and immediately worked on building locally hosted tournament realms. I think it was about a 36 hour turnaround time, and so we we removed that component because it was a risk. And so I guess that's what it comes down to is, is at, at some point um, you have to be effective in that space and your players fundamentally don't care whose fault it is. Uh, if they can't consume your product, it's, it's, a, it's a, a problem that you have to solve for. All right, so it's time. Uh, thank you very much, Lance. That was a, 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 a really good dive into.